and Talbot, who are major customers of theirs commercially, are going to call the shots. The possibility of failure doesn't please Frank Williams. Sponsors don't like losers. They like to see their three million pounds spent on winning. It, we will need to do more testing than we would normally have planned because it's a whole new ball game with the, the new rules. And one has a short space of time, so you have to throw a lot of things at the car. Like Neil right now is trying all sorts of not unusual things, but he has to cover a lot of ground. Um, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't today stand here and say, oh, these rules have cost us a lot of money. No, not today. The biggest thing about Frank is that he's a 100% racer. He's only interested in motor racing, nothing else. It's very unusual for a man that successful to be so devoted to his profession. And he's not sidetracked by any of the peripheral things that he can have. He's not interested in buying planes or going away to summer. It's in the winter. He, all he wants to do is just go racing. And uh, when he does travel, it's to go and negotiate more sponsorship or to, uh, to talk about new technical developments. They're not really part of the Formula One circus, the British Formula One circus. The mechanics don't necessarily associate with the other team mechanics. The engineers are incredibly worried about secrecy and revealing information. And it gets the hackles up of other teams. But at the end of the day, he's won the championship. You know? And that's, that's what goes in the record book, and that's what it's all about. It's 1.40, and with the gear ratios now matching the tyre diameters, Alan Jones drops into first as he enters the straight. Second. Third. Fourth, then shuts down. Williams only had two mechanical failures last season, both times in the gearbox. This is a pinion from Alan Jones's gearbox from Monaco. As you can see, one of the teeth is missing from the pinion. This is a fatigue failure. Uh, Alan was laying second place at the time and a very good chance of winning the race. There's a standard pinion, as you can see, with all teeth intact. So that really cost Alan the race. Bob Torrey, Williams gearbox expert. Again, we have another failure here. This was due to an oil union failure. All the oil drained from the transmission, and uh, this was in South Africa. That's the result. Again, the component should look like the one behind. It transmits engine power to the gearbox, a vital link. I find that one of the drivers is a lot harder on the gearbox than the other one. The days of the mechanic in greasy overalls and working out of backstreet garages and things like this are long gone. You can't trust anybody. You have to check everything 100%, you know, for yourself. Any component you buy in from outside, you have to make sure that is up to scratch. And it's no good saying when you get a bit tired at night time and you've had a long day, oh, that'll be OK, we'll do that. Because there's no way, because in two laps in practice, it's going to fall apart. And, uh, you're in trouble. Another team is out testing on the same circuit. They seem to have better tyres. Frank Williams and Alan Jones keep a wary eye on their lap times. It's mid-afternoon, still cold and windy. Frank Williams, anxious to make the best use of his time at the circuit, suggests to Neil Oakley that they might get more consistent downforce with the car if the springs are removed completely. It's a surprisingly drastic idea, but rumours that the new Lotus has no suspension mean they must try it just in case. So it's back into the workshop. Theoretically, a solid, unsprung car won't pitch and roll, and any high-pressure air getting under the car should at least leak in evenly, giving better control to Jones on the corners. Neil Oakley decides the car will be too low to lift the skirts, so they will have to come right off. The 
secret underside profile of the Williams, for so long hidden to all but its closest engineers, can now be seen for the first time. The carefully designed skirt, Formula One's most argued over component, is finally discarded. Half an hour after the decision to take the springs off, the job is done, and a highly modified car is back on the track. Ten past four, and down comes the rain. As the rain sets in, it makes a break for the first time in seven hours. For a while, thoughts return to last year's glory of champagne and British victories. Thoughts, too, of beating the French in their bright yellow, all-powerful, turbocharged factory cars. It was David and Goliath all over again. Williams proved small was beautiful. They proved attention to detail, cool drivers and reliable engines could do for Britain what Nuvolari had done for Italy. But the French mean to win. The French are very, um, very political sort of people in motor racing because the, the governing body is based in France and Renault is the, the spearhead of the French Formula One effort. You're on the side of their transporter, they don't say Renault Formula One team, they say a keep Formula One turbo which shows the sort of promotional pressures they're under. They have to go racing. At the 